Hey everybody, this is Matt. Again, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin addresses. How do they work? How are they made? Uh, what are they all about? I keep getting emails about them. People are uncertain about how to use them and what's going on. So I thought I'd... I'm not a super expert in it, but I know enough, I think, to clear the air on some of the issues here. So I am at the Wikipedia site for Bitcoin and I'll put this link in here and we're going to step through the process. At the top there's a little diagram here that I've also opened up in another page here so we'll be going back and forth but uh, there's actually while at the beginning it may seem pretty complicated there's really not a heck of a lot to it <clears throat> and I'm going to try not to clear my throat a thousand times this time and see how I do. <laughs> Alright so the first step is to start with a 256 bit number now, having a, uh, a key that is 256 digits long, where each digit is a 0 or 1, uh, that would just go off the page quite a bit. So we don't show it as a 256 digit number, we show it as a uh, in bytes, in hexadecimal form. And so 256 is actually 32 bytes. Each pair of hex is a uh, byte, so we have 32 pairs in here. <clears throat> and that's that's the uh, how we show this number. Now this number is huge. It's like more atoms than there are in the universe. At least it can be. It can be all zeros all the way up to all Fs. And all Fs is a really big number. <clears throat> and I should actually say that if you're going to make an ECDSA key from this number, which we're about to do, there is a little bit... Uh, you can't use every single number in a 256-bit range. There's a few at the end. But for all intents and purposes, essentially you have most of the whole, like 99.999% of that spectrum is, is yours. So uh, you don't have to worry about it. Now, I've talked about generating an address in the past, and we used a hash, a brain wallet, which takes a passphrase and converts the password into a 256-bit uh, number for you. So it's a kind of a fast, easy way to generate a number, and it's kind of neat because it's also repeatable. You can, you can use that same passphrase again in the future, use the same hash on it, uh, hash function on it, SHA-256 most likely, and get the same output. So it's a repeatable way to easily generate a 256-bit number. But if you wanted to, you could just kind of fill in your own 32-bit uh, pair, 32-byte uh, pair, I should say. <clears throat> so, uh, and start with this. So this is your secret key. And what happens is it gets run through the ECDSA key creation process to make a public key from it. This is considered your private starting point that only you should ever know. <clears throat> and then it's fed through the, the, the elliptic curve DSA uh, function to create what's called the public key. And the uh, public key is very long. And this could be all there ever was to the Bitcoin process. For example, we could just be giving this out as our public key and say, hey, pay me and pay to this address, and that could have been the way we do it. However, this is 512 bytes, actually 513 because there's an extra byte out in front. <clears throat> A, uh, an ECDSA key has to do with geometry. You may have heard of elliptic uh, codes, uh, elliptic curves, and an X and Y coordinate on the curve, blah, blah, blah. I don't really know how it works. Half of this code essentially is an X coordinate, half of it's a Y coordinate, and this is always 04 for whatever reason. By the way, here we are on this picture, and here we are at the public key, where half of it's the X, half of it's the Y, and then there's a 04 in front, the first byte. <clears throat> so. This is a little bit of voodoo here. I don't understand this to this process, but it's always the same. You start with this, you get to this. However, it's too long. If we were going to have a whole bunch of transactions in the blockchain, uh, this long key is uh, a little too much to work with. So what Satoshi decided to do was say, listen, let's make this smaller. And also, let's add in some error corrections so we can detect if someone types an address incorrectly. So that was nice of him to think of that. So here's what he did. He took this output, which is all we need to really do the digital signing, <clears throat> and then we did a, or he, he specified, you then run it through a hash. You perform a uh, SHA-256 hash on it, which means we now have a smaller code. This is the hash of, uh, this is the 256-bit hash, so it's kind of the same size as what we have up here. And uh, then what we do is we run it through a new hash that gives us an even smaller number. Uh, so the first one was SHA-256, the next one is RIPEMD-160, and I guess that's how you say it. Now, you might ask, why are we doing this? And one of the things that's kind of unfortunate is it is possible to have, two, uh, have uh, this public key 
hash to this address and have another public key hash to the same address. That would be a collision, and that is possible, and that is a problem. Uh, but the odds of that happening are so remote that you know you could have all the computers on Earth generating addresses trillions of times a second, and you just it's not going to happen. It's essentially like saying uh, picking a random atom in the universe and having someone else pick that same atom. It's about the same likelihood, so we don't have to worry too much about that. <clears throat> so we go to 16. The other thing, note, is we're using two different hash algorithms. SHA-256 has one method. It's very interesting if you ever look into it. RIPEMD is a completely different way. So we have the kind of the best of both worlds. We're taking the output of one function that makes garbage, and we're, we're putting it into a new function that makes garbage in a different way, although it's also shorter. <clears throat> so it's harder to go in reverse is the whole point. And then all they do is slap a 0, zero in front of it, or whatever... Uh, you add a byte to it to say what kind of uh, address are we making here and that's because I think the graphic has a nice version of it here it is a SHA-256 and then right then they throw a byte in front so the, the SHA-160 is down to 20 bytes which is a, a 160 bits and they throw a byte in front of it to say what kind of address are we making is this if the byte is zero then that means this is a real address to be used on the real Bitcoin network a lot of people don't know that there's actually a secondary Bitcoin network, a test net they call it, to play around with new versions of the software, make sure it works. And so they needed to make a different kind of address that was similar but identically different to use on it. And so for whatever reason, they came up with 6F as the first byte to put there. So <clears throat> this uh, so this really should be 6F if, uh, excuse me, 00. zero instead of, yeah, it is 00. zero. So this, is, this would be an address on the regular Bitcoin network. And then they, that's essentially your address here. From now on, the next steps that we're going to be doing have to do with making sure you type it in correctly. Type it in correctly, that is. And so here's what they do. And I'm going to switch over to the graphic because it's a little easier to understand. You'll notice this byte, excuse me, this, these 20 bytes, which is the hash 160 of the hash 256 of your public key. This also goes down to the end. But let's let's actually just follow through here. <clears throat> uh, we take these bytes and these 21 bytes that is, and we run it through SHA-256 again. And whatever comes out of there, we run it through SHA-256 again, so a double hash, and we get 32 bytes. And the first four of those bytes, kind of marked as the dotted line area, get sucked in and put to the end of what you started with. So the end here is exactly what you started with plus four bytes of data. And the idea is, if you mess up either any of these bytes, the one byte in the beginning, or any of the 20, or even any of the, of the four, uh, if someone, if you're typing in a, yeah, an address, all the program has to do to check that you typed it incorrectly is take the first, this byte and the 20, so the 21 bytes, go through this process, get the four bytes, and then compare the four bytes it gets to the four last bytes that you typed in. If you typed in everything correctly, then everything should match, then the four bytes it figures out will match the four you ended with. If you uh, did anything wrong in any one of these locations, these three, then this won't match anymore and that is the check that will fail. So if you're ever typing in a public address to send to, a Bitcoin address I should say, uh, and you're just freaking out that you want to make sure you type it in correctly, well, uh, this check is going to help you out a lot because it's uh, Essentially, this four bytes is that's a four billion uh, combinations approximately. So you have about a one in billion and four billion chance of typing it incorrectly, but still having it verified correctly. So you, the odds are on your side that uh, it's going to catch any errors you make. Finally, this is still 25 bytes. 20 plus 4 plus 1. That's a lot to remember. That's 25 pairs. Uh, so why don't we, sh instead of representing it as bytes, why don't we convert it into base 58, which essentially allows us to use more than just the letters A through F and 0 through 9 with hex, but they actually allow you to essentially do A through Z, upper and lower in all the numbers, except they take a few of the letters out that are easy to mix, with, uh, mix up with others. That's why they say 58 instead of 26 plus 26 would be 52, plus 10 combinations would be 62, I guess. Uh, they took away, it looks like, four letters that were not, uh, I think it's like lowercase l and uppercase o, you know, that can be mistaken for one and zero, that kind of thing. And then there's your Bitcoin address at the end. All right, so a lot of this stuff isn't even security related. It's just to make sure you type it incorrectly. Now, the uh, the thing is, though, <clears throat> that your public uh, key, I, 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 I'm afraid I don't remember exactly how this works, but I believe your public key, when you actually send coins from an, an address, you actually reveal your public key. 
because your public key has to be used in the signing authentication because you sign a transaction with your public with your private key and your public key is used to verify that this is correct and so you have to provide your public key in the transaction so it can act, be verified uh, and shown that the person who has the private key you uh, did in fact do this uh, sign this transaction so that means you're exposing your private key. You're actually uh, taking away the SHA-256 and RIPE-MD part and you're, you're actually showing everybody your private key. And that's not the end of the world because the whole point is it's hard to go, it's literally impossible to go backwards from your private key back, but you've kind of given up a couple layers of extra security, the SHA-256 and the RIPE-MD-160 that would have had to have been reversed as well. So theoretically you made it slightly easier for someone to figure out your private key, but it's still like you know one of these things where all the computers and all the time in the universe still won't, won't figure out, so you're okay. But that's why you'll often hear people say, listen, if you're going to send money from address A to address B, you might as well send all the change not back to address A, but to a new address C that you make on the fly. That way you don't, uh, because uh, the private key for address A is now exposed to all who uh, can see the transaction, which is everyone. But address C that you just made on the fly, no one's seen the private key yet. All they've seen is this part here from which uh, they can't even figure out what your, uh, excuse me, no one's seen your public key yet of your address C, the new address, uh, but they do, they see your Bitcoin address, of course, but they don't even get to see, have visibility on the public key yet. So that's just a little bit of extra layers of security to this hashing that you do give up that when you, when you send coins from an address. So addresses are free, you might as well make a new one. Uh, that's why when I do cold storage, uh, if I'm going to send from it, I'm just going to send all of it uh, to uh, whomever I'm sending it to and all the change to a new address. And that's why Satoshi did that by default in the Bitcoin wallet. So, and that's one other reason, by the way, if you have a Bitcoin wallet, it, I think it pre-generates a lot of change addresses so that if you back up your wallet and then you uh, then spend some money from your Bitcoin address, you, the change will usually go to one of the, sp the addresses that have already been pre-generated. But if you use up all those pre-generated uh, since the last backup and it make, has to make some new ones, you're not going to have those new ones in your in your wallet backup. So keep backing up your wallet, uh, especially if you're using your wallet often. Uh, use it. Uh, it's a good idea to back it up every time you use it. That's why blockchain.info, by the way, emails you your wallet every time you do something, uh, just to make sure you keep everything intact. So anyway, hopefully that explains the uh, address is a little easier. The point takeaway though is there's your bottom line address, <laughs> and there's your private key, and all those steps in between are, are how addresses are made. All right. Talk to you guys later.